Uh, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, so it's really exciting for me to be here and um, talk about this work on diffuse scattering, um, uh, which is so important to me. Um, and I was very happy to hear John mention in his talk that uh, diffuse scattering is an opportunity for the future uh, with uh, metadata, which I strongly believe. So I want to just start by reviewing uh, what diffuse scattering is. So uh, here's a, an image uh, that was created synthetically. Uh, it's a regular pattern, and each unit cell, uh, if you like, within this image has the same pattern, and so we get a pattern of perfect Bragg peaks. Uh, if we were to take a, an image that is related to that one and introduce some variation, but two different types of variation. On the left, I have one type that's based on two different types of uh, unit cell. And on the right, I have uh, an image that is uh, based on two different types, uh, four different types of unit cell. Now, the thing about these two is they have the same mean pattern, uh, both the left and the right. So the mean unit cell looks the same. So the, the diffraction pattern, uh, the Bragg peaks look the same but they're clearly distinguishable by the background pattern, which is the diffuse scattering. And so this is what diffuse scattering is all about. It's trying to relate these background features to the underlying variations in the, in the crystal. And uh, these patterns are seen, uh, to some degree at least, in essentially every protein crystal diffraction uh, experiment. Um, so uh, this image is, is distorted on the slide uh, in your view. Uh, it looks ovular, but actually this is meant to be a square image. And so uh, this is protein diffraction. It's diffraction from a calmodulin crystal. It has a background pattern that we're all familiar with. Um, to some degree in the background we see this uh, solvent ring, which is actually equal parts, uh, more or less equal parts protein and solvent in reality. Um, this, this is related to the variational scattering that was already mentioned in uh, Lois's talk. In addition, we have streaked features, which we can see and that protein crystal diffraction patterns often have. Uh, and this is related to thermal diffuse uh, scattering or um, vibrations or maybe uh, other types of disorder in the protein crystal. And then uh, finally, there are these cloudy features as well that you can detect, which may be on uh, length scales in reciprocal space that are several Bragg peaks or at least more uh, larger than the distance between the Bragg peaks. Uh, but yet smaller scale than this ring. And so that's also related to the variational scattering. So uh, we wrote uh, a meeting report and perspective that argues that uh, it's time right now to analyze uh, diffuse X-ray scattering in protein crystallography. I wanted to mention um, the contributions and acknowledge the contributions of uh, Kathleen Lonsdale at this point, a student of Lawrence Bragg, she solved the benzene structure, which was uh, kind of an important milestone in medicinal chemistry. Uh, and she was a champion, a real champion of diffuse X-ray scattering, wrote a very influential review in 1942 on the subject, uh, covering both the experiment and theory. Fellow of the Royal Society, one of the first two women uh, to be so, along with Marjorie Stevenson and she was OBE and first woman president of the uh, IUCR. So at the time of Lonsdale, uh, the theory that was uh, around to describe diffuse scattering is this thermal diffuse scattering. And uh, this, I think, uh, in its complete form was um, done most completely by Born and Sargentson in uh, 1941, and this is a version that we know today. Uh, so it's also found in James, which is where people might have read about thermal diffuse scattering or other books. And I do apologize, there's a symbol in this slide which did not come through. That's a summation sign, is the square. Um, there's, a, there's another theory, and again, it seems like the symbols are missing in here. I do apologize for that. But I think most of those boxes should be replaced by uh, sigmas. Um, so the key aspect of this slide is, um, and I'll try to use this, this equation here, uh, which describes the variational diffuse scattering. It's under the assumption that the variations in the unit cell are independent from unit cell to unit cell, but still there are correlations within the unit cell. And what you get is uh, an expression which is the variance uh, 
of the unicell structure factor in the crystal. And so this is the equation that enables us to, say, relate molecular dynamic simulations to diffuse scattering. And it, it is general. Um, so I became interested in this problem by working on um, the problem of diffuse scattering in staphylococcal nuclease. And I developed some methods for integrating uh, data sets collected that had strong enough diffuse signals uh, to form a, a three-dimensional integration that's very similar to the type of integration that you do for your Bragg peaks. So uh, this lattice that you're looking at on the right, an isosurface, is essentially the same as a Bragg lattice with some values. It's an isosurface in there. And those values, instead of being Bragg intensities, they're diffuse intensities. And uh, they, they vary um, in uh, a way that's consistent with the cloudy features that you see in the uh, diffraction image. The methods for this uh, are now available in a software repository. I wouldn't call it a package that uh, people would uh, use off the shelf, but uh, a, a series of uh, command line uh, routines for image processing and other functions uh, is called Lunis. And then uh, we applied these to Calmodulin and uh, looked at uh, both the, the large scale features, but then here I'm showing integration of features in the neighborhood of the streaked feature uh, that's seen in this image, and you can do sampling that is on a finer scale than the Bragg lattice. Uh, sometimes this is called a Gibbs lattice, or at least that's what we called it in George Phillips's lab. Okay, so this shows some of the modeling that we've uh, done. At that time, uh, the types of models that we were using were these phenomenological models that are described essentially by this equation at the top. This equation has two key components. One is something that's like a debye waller factor. Um, you have a U matrix that's uh, just like a U matrix in crystallography. This one is applied to uniformly uh, to all atoms. And you see this one minus that debye waller factor uh, that's because what goes into the diffuse scattering is what is lost by the Bragg. Um, the other key feature is this gamma. And what this does is to uh, uh, convolute with the squared structure factors to smear them. And this gives rise to a background pattern that is uh, the um, diffuse features. And depending on the width of this function, you, you get uh, different sized smearing in the background. There's a couple of different uh, ways that uh, we've done this. One is through the liquid-like motions uh, that was introduced by Donald Casper et al. And for staph nuclease and calmodulin, we, we applied this and uh, extracted some dynamical parameters. For um, calmodulin, we additionally did this uh, model using something that's like acoustic modes. It's anisotropic, and we found that there was anis anisotropy in those uh, streak features. So more recently, we've become interested in the potential of molecular dynamics simulations to uh, uh, describe variations in the protein crystal and testing those models with diffuse scattering. So uh, just to review, in molecular dynamics, we set up, say, a Lagrangian with the kinetic energy minus the potential, and then we can uh, develop a uh, set of dynamical equations based on F equals MA. And uh, we numerically solve these equations forward in time. Here it shows you what the configuration is as a function of time, depending on these forces. And there are lots of standard packages to do this. We use Bromax. This shows um, staphylococcal nuclease crystal looking down the P41 axis with uh, the small molecules being water and the big one, the big rendered uh, spheres uh, being counter ions. So uh, in um, the 1990s, um, Jim Claridge had done some studies using molecular dynamic simulations to simulate um, the motions of uh, both myoglobin and uh, lysosine. 
And he, he found something uh, kind of interesting. He found that when he calculated the diffuse intensity from the predicted trajectories, he would try different simulations and he'd get different answers. And the reason why that was the case is because of limited sampling. So even though if you um, run a simulation uh, through, and this is showing a projection of the coordinates into a three-dimensional space, it illustrates the uh, 500 picoseconds of this simulation, and it illustrates that there wasn't, really wasn't very good sampling. Um, still, you could calculate the mean of this trajectory and get a fairly good idea of what the mean structure is. But to get these fluctuations, uh, the variance of the uh, structure factor, uh, that was not reproducible. About 10 years later, uh, Meinhold and Smith looked at staphylococcal nuclease uh, and compared it to the data that we had collected earlier. And uh, they saw a better agreement using a 10 nanosecond simulation. And what they found is that um, they saw during the course of the simulation uh, from uh, zero to 10 nanoseconds, they got improved agreement with the uh, diffuse data. And they predicted that after about a microsecond, they would get some sort of convergence by their measures. So recently, we performed a one microsecond simulation of staphylococcal nuclease. And what this is showing here is in two dimensions, the um, kind of an equivalent picture of what I showed you in three dimensions from the Claret study. Uh, and what we see is uh, individual uh, metastable states. So this is about to here is the first 10 nanoseconds of the simulation. And then the system wanders around in this configurational space eventually gets here. So um, within uh, a specific local region, we see extensive sampling. And then now and then, the system leaves that local region and, and uh, jumps into uh, another neighboring region in configurational space. And this is what we want to see, some local sampling of a metastable state and then hopping to another state, which is uh, thoroughly sampled, and so on. So this is the pattern that we see in this simulation. And so what we found is we were able to get reproducible uh, calculations of diffuse intensity using such a long trajectory. Uh, in this space, we were able to relate this to the uh, functional motions of staphylococcal nuclease. In particular, in, in this projection, which is along the principal components of the trajectory, we see uh, motions of this loop, which uh, would likely modulate ligand binding. And we also see uh, motions of this loop, uh, which is related to the hydrolysis reaction. And then if we compare that to variations in crystal structures, uh, we also see that the motions that we find in the simulation in this loop are reflected by variations in the crystal structure. And again, in this loop, uh, there, there are variations in the crystal structure. So these motions that are predicted by the ND simulations also, also seem consistent with the variations just by Bragg analysis. When we compare the predicted diffuse intensity uh, by this uh, equation that I showed you previously to the data, uh, what we've done is first compared the, the total intensity. So the total intensity, if we calculate a Pearson correlation over 14,800 measurements that result from extracting the uh, diffuse intensity and um, only counting uh, data points that are not related by symmetry, we get a Pearson correlation of 0.94. If we just extract the component under the data that's the isotropic component, and you can think of this as being like doing a small angle scattering profile. Um, if we look at the data, it's in red. If we calculate from the MD model and then just scale it using an overall scale factor but no other free parameters, uh, we get this kind of uh, overlap. So there is a good agreement between the data and the MD model and looking at it from this kind of isotropic point of view. If we decompose the model into the protein and solvent components, the total is in blue here. We see the solvent in um, magenta, and then the protein is in green. And we see the protein and the solvent have uh, more or less equivalent contributions to the um, 
solvent ring, the so-called solvent ring. So this is where that comes from in part. If we then subtract that isotropic component and just look at the anisotropic component of the data, um, we get this picture. This is an isosurface in, in that map from the data. And then this is from the MD model. And if we overlay them, we get this kind of agreement. And the agreement currently uh, that we get is a correlation coefficient of 0.49 in this very detailed map. And so we um, have a substantial agreement right now, and it's ongoing work to improve that through more MD simulations and other methods. And that's uh, one very interesting thing to us going forward. Um, so Andrew Van, Van, Van Binshoten um, in uh, James Fraser's lab has been uh, interested in picking up this problem and has recently uh, taken this equation and applied it within Phoenix to a method called Phoenix.diffuse that's now available. And um, he has uh, now a, a pipeline uh, that takes a P2B structure, a set of P2B structures as an input and performs the same operations that I've shown you on the previous um, pages uh, with the MD. Um, in this case, he applied it to uh, T TLS models and uh, calculating uh, the final map of diffuse scattering. So uh, this is this is recently published work. And um, in James Fraser's lab, in general, there are ongoing experiments uh, to look at diffuse scattering, and I am collaborating closely with him to uh, do the processing of those data sets. And this just shows you um, a combination of process data sets from his lab and from other labs now uh, that are sending data. And uh, so the, the number of data sets now is, is expanding beyond the more limited number that were available previously. So the imaging, image processing and scripts for this uh, are again in the Lunas um, package, uh, not package, uh, software repository. And uh, the Dials indexing methods are used for this, and uh, methods were provided by Nicholas Soder and Aaron Brewster. And again, the experiments were from James Fraser and, and others. So uh, thinking about the uh, metadata aspect, um, I won't dwell on the raw images, but um, from my perspective in developing these new methods, it's very nice to be able to just pull out of a repository, not necessarily deposit in a repository in this form, but a form that I'd like it to come out in is uh, without compression, simple layout of the data, uh, human readable header. Uh, these, are, these are handy just for the uh, way that I like to look at the data. Uh, the beam metadata, I think, are basically very similar to what Lois has already uh, presented. Um, and I don't have a lot to add except that the polarization uh, is a very important aspect for um, these studies. Um, I think Lois already mentioned the relation of the ADUs to the X-ray counts, and um, that's also very important for the diffuse scattering. I think where my, maybe I have uh, the most to add here is in looking at what's needed for the crystal. And uh, so in looking at Bragg data, uh, mostly we're in the position of being able to distinguish the Bragg reflections from the background just by the small size, their peaked features, and at least to uh, some approximation can be uh, subtracted from the background using some sort of image processing methods. With the diffuse features, we're not really in that position. Uh, everything in the background um, may be of similar length scales, um, so the any extraneous scattering from sources other than the crystal might be confused with a diffuse scattering. So we need to make sure that we can adequately separate the two. And for that, uh, I think it's very useful to have images of the crystal uh, from the beam line. So um, what would be very nice is for each, each exposure to have a light microscopy image that corresponds to the precise orientation of the crystal during that exposure. And um, we could collect a set of those, and we could even do a full 
rotation series and create a tomographic view of the crystal and the specimen. And uh, this isn't currently done now, but I think in the future this would be very useful for separating the different components of the signal into the different parts, the loop, the solvent, the crystal. Uh, I think it's very important, especially for the diffuse scattering, to um, have that available. Of course, right now we don't even have the uh, integrated diffuse data being deposited in um, the PDB. So uh, also important, in addition to the metadata, is defining how the diffuse data might be deposited. Uh, I think some of the issues that come up with the diffuse data might start to um, spill over into needs for the Bragg data, because I think one future uh, application of the diffuse scattering is to come up with a better model of the background so that the Bragg data and diffuse data can be better separated. And uh, a part of that, I think, will, will be an increased amount of information that is deposited just about the indexing um, and the integration that's applied. And then model deposition, I think the, the biggest challenge here might be that these MD trajectories can become very large. Um, so uh, anywhere from uh, 30 gigabytes to you know, terabytes, depending on how much information you hold on to. Um, I don't think it's, it's known precisely how much you need to reproduce these calculations of diffuse intensities. So if that's not feasible, you can at least have the calculated diffuse intensities available, which are the precise model that ultimately you're comparing to the data. Um, but um, I think that this is something that uh, needs a lot of thought as well. So I just want to acknowledge uh, the contributions of many superb scientists that I've had the pleasure of working with and who supported this work. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, James Fraser right now especially has been collecting some new uh, experimental data sets, um, and that's been very uh, encouraging and inspiring. And then also at Los Alamos, Tom Terwilliger has uh, been a uh, big supporter of this work, and I'd like to thank him. And finally, John Halliwell and Brian McMahon for inviting me to participate in this workshop and uh, also supporting um, my attendance. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for another fascinating presentation. And time for two questions. Hi, hey, Michael. Thank you for your very nice talk. I enjoyed it. Um, do you have any uh, ideas about, um, let's say, guiding people in collecting uh, diffuse scattering images? I mean, if we do a single crystal data collection and you have a rough idea of what the eye of sigmas would be for reflection on the edge of, uh, of the resolution limit, is there any way or do you have any experience with how to how to determine this for diffuse scattering. So what should be the signal over noise in the background or in diffuse scattering? Do you have any guidelines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I think with the diffuse scattering, what we need to keep in mind is that you have a lower absolute intensity on a pixel by pixel basis, but you have that intensity spread out over uh, a larger number of pixels. So really we need to keep in mind what is the actual intensity that we're looking at. So it can be a little bit um, uh, looser, let's say, or, or less precisely defined to some extent than integrating a, a single Bragg peak. But if we look at the features that I'm extracting um, on the large scale, what we expect is that the total integrated intensity corresponding to the diffuse scattering the neighborhood with Bragg peak should be comparable uh, to the intensity of the uh, Bragg peak that's in that neighborhood. So um, basically, I, I think the signal to noise considerations should be similar uh, the, between the two if we look at it from that perspective. Okay. Um, I think the main thing, though, is this issue of separating that statistical measure uh, from the, the background features that might be there from, say, scattering from the capillary, from the loop, um, the first 
thing is to minimize the contributions from those sources, but then also to understand them more precisely uh, also so they can possibly be separated. So. Very nice, Mike. I have a question for you and for Vladek. So you mentioned the possibility of using a better understanding of diffuse scattering to um, getting a better measurement of the Bragg peaks. And my question is, is it really plausible that the amount of understanding of the details of the shape of the diffuse density would be sufficiently um, structured in the region of a Bragg peak that it would actually be better than the current algorithms for just taking an average and a, a plane of uh, density around the Bragg peak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that when you have a streaked feature in the neighborhood of the Bragg peaks, I think it's more important than when you have something that's more spread out. Uh, probably the current algorithms are going to be adequate in the, in the case where they're spread out. In the case where you have a, a streaked feature, I do think that you would at least improve the accuracy if you have a correct model of what that background feature is. So that's what we're really talking about here. Um, in the case of Calmodulin, I, I think that we were able to distinguish between two alternative uh, models of the streak in the neighborhood of the Bragg Peak. We tried this liquid-like motions model, and we also tried the uh, acoustic modes model, and we found the acoustic modes were more consistent with uh, the data. So at least at that level, we've been able to um, characterize differences in the neighborhood of the Bragg Peak. So based on that, I would say that there would be at least some benefit from looking at uh, the background and modeling it more precisely. So. Yes, I, I, I agree. There are two problems, yes. First, I mean, additional problems. That the question is, how good is your crystal? Do you have a really single black peak? Or do you have three black peaks? And you have to process each one in that case, yes. And the second is uh, that we can uh, obviously calculate the shape using the parallax, I mean, using the various collection, but spherical detector would be really great for that. And we can manipulate data to use spherical detector, to, to present it as, as a spherical detector. And this is something uh, which could be done and you could try to process the data from the spherical detector. Yes, I mean from virtual spherical detector. That's a good point. Thanks. Mm -hmm.